We're going to look at Egypt in Bible prophecy. We're not going to look at all the prophecies about Egypt in the scriptures. Uh, there is so much of it. Uh, the background pictures are pictures taken in Egypt. The, uh, the background to the first uh, picture that we've got there is that Abu Simbel, uh, a long way down Lake Nasser, uh, which was formed when the Aswan Dam was built. Uh, this would have been under the water, so they took it piece by piece, uh, assisted by the United Nations financially, uh, and put it uh, on, the, uh, on the shore of the new lake. And so it's, it's a map, you can see the size of these statues in, uh, in Abu Simbel, uh, compared with the people that are standing there down below. Uh, so it's, uh, it was a, a remarkable feat of, uh, of engineering to put it there. But we're interested in Bible prophecy. So we're going to look now at, uh, first of all, the first prophecy that I know of in the Bible about Egypt is in the book of Genesis. So I want to go to uh, Genesis chapter 15. We're in the time of Abraham, and uh, he has been promised that we'll ha he'll have a multitude of descendants, although he had no child as yet. Uh, verse 5 says, uh, God brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if they be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's the sort of faith that Abraham had. And then God gives him a prophecy. Verse 13. God said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them. Four hundred years. So four hundred years will cover the time of being a stranger, uh, and serve the Egyptians and then the Egyptians were going to afflict them. The whole period of 400 years uh, was the period of all those three elements. And we go on to um, verse 14. Also, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. So they're going to be there 400 years and there's Afterward, they shall come out with great substance. We don't know how long after this 400 years, uh, but they're going to come out with great substance. And if we go on to verse 18, we read that in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, there is on the border of Israel and Egypt in Bible times uh, a, a wadi called uh, the river of Egypt the wadi of Egypt but this isn't, this isn't a wadi uh, the Hebrew word is nahar it means a continuously flowing river and so we believe it refers to the Nile so if we go on to the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 19 uh, we read there of a prophecy concerning Egypt, which we'll be referring to, returning to later. Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 1 says, The burden of Egypt. So the prophecy is about Egypt in chapter 19. Uh, and in verse 5 it says, And the water shall fail from the sea, and the river, that's the Anahar, shall be wasted and dried up. So clearly that's talking about the river Nile in Egypt. Uh, there is no great river uh, apart from the river Nile uh, and that was to be wasted and dried up. So it refers to the Nile, the word Nahar refers to the Nile in Isaiah uh, and it is referring to the, the Nile. So here's a great expanse of territory from the river Nile across to the Euphrates. It's a great tract of land that is promised to Abram, unto thy seed have I given this land. 
we shall be looking at that uh, towards the end of our talk. And it was the land of Egypt to which they went. Uh, the book of Genesis uh, tells us how Joseph was able to uh, save the land of Egypt and to uh, bring his family uh, down into Egypt. And in the book of Exodus, uh, we find that the Egyptians uh, made them slaves, uh, make them work for them, and then God delivered the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. Uh, we've you all have heard of the plagues of the, uh, that came upon the Egyptians, the ten plagues that came upon the Egyptians. Well, that was a part of the deliverance from the land of Egypt. The picture, incidentally, uh, is the picture uh, from the Aswan looking at the River Nile as it goes on down into Egypt. It's still a pretty hefty river. So, uh, the, the fulfilment of the prophecy. We go into the book of Exodus now, Exodus chapter 12. After the, uh, the plagues have been brought upon Egypt, uh, and the final plague uh, is uh, brought upon the Egyptians, the slaying of the Egyptian firstborn. In Exodus chapter 12 uh, and verse 12, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. And the, uh, the plagues were against uh, the things that the Egyptians worshipped, uh, and so the plagues came against the gods of Egypt. If we go on to verse 35, uh, we find that the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses and they borrowed, the word really means asked. Uh, they didn't borrow because they, were, they weren't going to give it back. Uh, they asked of the, uh, uh, the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Egyptians were so glad to, to see these people go from, that it caused them so much trouble with all these uh, plagues that had come upon them uh, that we see uh, the response in verse 36 uh, and the Lord gave the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians so they lent or gave unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians here was payment for these years of slavery uh, that the uh, people of Israel had suffered in Egypt and they were going to come out God said to Abraham, with great substance. And here's how it came about. Uh, they spoiled the Egyptians. If we go to verse 40. We read, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel, and it's the people of Israel who dwelt in Egypt. That phrase is a, uh, uh, is a descriptive phrase. Uh, so, so really what the sentence is saying the sojourning of the children of Israel was 430 years um, it was the Israel who dwelt in Egypt uh, that uh, the sojourning was 430 years we read that they would be in this process would take 400 years and afterward well it's 30 years afterward then so if we go on to uh, verse 41 we see something remarkable. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Exactly the same day in the Hebrew year, they came out of the land of Egypt. Just into the control there. God. 430 years was able to foretell that the people of Israel would be delivered from the land of Egypt with great substance. We go back beyond the Battle of Bosworth from our time. You see the sort of scale of time that we're talking about. 430 years was the uh, God was in control of the nations. And how precisely the, uh, the prophecy was fulfilled. And it was in the same day in the Hebrew year as the covenant that God made with Abram 
that they came out of the land of Egypt. That was a remarkable time. And uh, there's more that could be said about that. But uh, So there's the first prophecy and it was fulfilled as recorded in the scripture. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 19 and see what uh, another area of prophecy of Egypt. We're going to look at uh, Isaiah and uh, one or two chapters in Isaiah uh, briefly after we looked at chapter 19 uh, and then we're going to uh, look at the prophecy of Ezekiel. Uh, that's all the area that we're going to be looking at as far as Egypt and Bible prophecy is concerned. Well. Isaiah chapter 19, we've already seen, is about Egypt. It says, the burden of Egypt. Uh, Verse 1, we've already read. Uh, And then, uh, verse 4, we read, And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. So the Egyptians will be given over to the hand of a cruel lord. And that's been fulfilled uh, various way, uh, in various times since that time. The first cruel lord that ruled over them was the Assyrian. Uh, he invaded the land of Egypt. Then Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. The Romans uh, had it for a time. And yet there is uh, one further cruel lord, we believe, according to prophecy, and we believe that will be led uh, by the Russians. Uh, we'll perhaps see a bit more of that later on. But in Isaiah's time, he was told uh, concerning uh, the, uh, this uh, cruel Lord coming over them. And then it says in verse 5, And the waters shall fail uh, from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. So there's going to be... Uh, no flow of the river and the, uh, there will be no silt being brought down by the river no cleansing annual cleansing as the flooding of the river Nile uh, happened year by year uh, so that was all going to be uh, dried up and then it says in verse 6 and they shall turn the rivers far away and the brooks of defence shall be emptied and dried up the reeds and flags shall wither. Uh, and the, so the, uh, the, the reeds by the side of the river were, were going to be uh, decimated. Uh, they shall wither. Uh, and then uh, the verse 7 says, And the paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, uh, everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away and be no more. Our word paper comes from papyrus. It's it's a a triangular stem (coughs) reed uh, that grows particularly in Egypt, or used to grow particularly in Egypt. Uh, You can still see uh, enough to (coughs) to show how paper used to be made in times gone by. But it says that (coughs) the paper reeds shall wither and be driven away uh, and be no more. Uh, Verse 8. Uh, the fishers also shall mourn, and they that cast angle into the brook shall lament. They, shall spread net, they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. So that the fishing would be, uh, would be spoiled in, the, in Egypt. And then, in verse 9, Moreover, they that work in fla- fine flax, uh, they that weave networks shall be confounded. So the linen industry was going to be affected uh, in this time of desolation. Well, all this happened uh, years ago, um, and but there's been a similar series of disaster, c- catastrophes, disasters uh, related to the people of Egypt by the building of the Aswan Dam. So what we're going to have a look at now is the uh, the effects of the building of the Aswan Dam. The object in building the Aswan Dam was that there would be hydroelectric power. Uh, The water coming over the dam would develop electric power. Uh, And that was really successful. 
Uh, if you look at a satellite picture of Egypt at night, you can see the River Nile uh, in lights. Yes, there was plenty of hydroelectric power uh, was generated by the building of the Aswan Dam. The other object was increased irrigation that they would be able to increase the irrigated parts of the uh, around along the <coughs> River Nile uh, to multiply the amount of produce in Egypt. Well, let's have a look at the effects. First of all, when they built the dam, the lake that was built up behind it displaced a hundred thousand people so they had to find housing for a hundred thousand people. <coughs> Another effect of the building of the Aswan Dam is that the silt that normally used to come down and cleanse the river valley uh, it settles in Lake Nasser so they don't get the cleansing effect of the annual, annual uh, flooding of the River Nile. Because of that there's less flow in the River Nile and the land is less fertile uh, because it's not getting this, this silt which used to be a fertiliser uh, coming down the river. And so instead of increasing the produce uh, they've had to increase the amount of artificial fertilizers uh, and that's cost them more for the in the production of their crops and because of the reduction in the flow of the river nile the fertile strip by the river nile has narrowed rather than expanded they've not been able to irrigate as much as they hoped. We go to oh, the papyrus reed has indeed been decimated. Uh, as I say, the, the, you can still get enough reed uh, to for them to be able to show how much uh, how paper used to be made, uh, but there is no more nowhere near the number of reed papyrus reeds by the River Nile as they used to be. And because of the lack of the cleansing process by the, the annual inundations of the Nile, the in, uh, disease has been increased. Uh, I used to work in, uh, uh, in a firm connected with horticulture uh, and in one of the horticultural magazines uh, we read that in Egypt there was an 80 million a year onion crop that was destroyed by white rot because of the disease building up uh, because of the building of the Aswan Dam. Another effect is that the delta <coughs> has shrunk. It's shrinking so that you, you've not got the, uh, the, the, the detritus that comes through, uh, the, uh, the silt coming through, uh, building up the uh, delta and making it fertile. And one effect of that is that the plankton that used to be brought down is no longer there. And the sardines that used to feed on the plankton have disappeared. So they lost a sardine fishery that used to be great, uh, a great production in the land of Egypt. And instead of being increased, the irrigated area was reduced by 88 million square metres. Uh, it has indeed been an economic disaster uh, for <coughs> the Egyptians. And as we shall see, it seems that there may yet be further disasters related to the Aswan Dam. So let's go on through Isaiah chapter 19 then and see what else we are told about the Egyptians, what's going to happen to Egypt. Chapter 19 and verse 17. You just imagine a prophet in Isaiah's day saying this about Egypt. 
uh, chapter 19 uh, and verse 17. The land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts which he hath determined against it. The land of Judah? A terror to the land of Egypt? You just couldn't imagine it in Isaiah's day. It had to be inspired by God. But in the Six Day War, the Israeli aircraft destroyed the, uh, the Egyptian air force on the ground before it was able to take off. And so Judah was indeed a terror to the land of Egypt on that occasion. And certainly Israel has become a, a considerable military power in that area. It goes on to say in verse 18, In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to Yahweh of hosts. The one that, and the one shall be called the city of destruction. They're going to worship the God of Israel. It's not going to be Allah. There's going to be a time when they're going to worship the God of Israel. Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so the prophecy is telling us that there, is, there are things that are going to happen to Egypt. We're already in recent times, in Judah being a terror to Egypt, uh, now we've got a prophecy that the Egyptians are going to worship the God of Israel. And then verse 19, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. They're going to have an altar. As far as I know, in prophecy, this is the only place outside uh, the land of Israel where there's going to be a place of worship. And as far as prophecy is concerned, surely there will be uh, places of worship uh, in, uh, in most countries. But here's one actually spoken of, an altar to the Lord, uh, to Yahweh in the land of Egypt. And then if we go to verse 22, we read, And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and heal them. So there's going to be an invasion of the land of Egypt. Other prophecies speak of this. And the Lord shall smite Egypt by that invasion but then the Egyptians are going to call upon the God of Israel to deliver them and God is going to be entreated of them and is going to heal them how great is our God he's in control and so verse 23 goes on to say in that day there shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria and the Egyptian shall serve with the Assyrians so not only Egypt but over the other side Iraq and Syria that area are going to serve God and they're going to have a highway you try to get a highway uh, through the land of Israel uh, from from Iraq and into Egypt. You can um, do it nowadays. But there is going to be one. Here is a great change is going to happen amongst the uh, nations of the earth. And so in verse 25 we read, Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. There's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem and the tribes that are closest to the temple are going to be most blessed among the children of Israel. Now as you get further out there will be, uh, be less blessings. And it's going to be true of the nations. The nations that are closest to the land of Israel are going to be blessed and here it is. Blessed be Egypt, my people, 
and Assyria uh, the work of my hands. Those two nations closest to Israel are going to be blessed among the nations. And right in the middle, Israel, mine inheritance. A great change is going to take place and the, uh, in the land of Egypt. And we've seen how the one prophecy has been fulfilled in Genesis, how the early part of Isaiah chapter 19 uh, was full, fulfilled long ago, but there are things that are yet to happen. God is in control. Well, that's uh, one chapter in Isaiah. Uh, we'll go on to one or two others. Uh, chapter 20 and verse 3. Uh, and the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt, money upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians' prisoners and the Egyptians' captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. And so it happened. The Assyrian came down and invaded Egypt uh, and took the Egyptians' captive. If we go on to chapter 27, uh, we have a prophecy concerning the restoration of the nation of Israel. Isaiah chapter 27 uh, and verse 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So Egypt and Assyria are going to be involved in the regathering of the nation of Israel to the land. <coughs> Another prophecy concerning the role of Egypt in uh, days to come. In chapter 30 we have a warning to the people of Israel not to put their trust in Egypt. Uh, chapter 30 of Isaiah uh, and verse 2, they walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. If you put your trust in Egypt, they'll let you down. That's the language of Isaiah and it's there in chapter 31 too. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and horsemen because they are very strong but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel neither seek the Lord and that's the first of three reasons at least three reasons which we shall be coming to as we continue now so the Egyptians were going to let the, uh, well, the Israelites were going to put their trust in Egypt and uh, then, uh, they, then they would be caught. Uh, that's one reason for uh, what we're going to see. Right, let's go on to the prophecy of Ezekiel now in chapter 29. We didn't have the whole chapter read, um, but we should be referring to one or two more bits than the uh, ones we saw. So if we go on to uh, verse 18 of Ezekiel chapter 29. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled, yet had he no wages nor his army for Tyrus for the service that he had served against it. What happened uh, was that Nebuchadnezzar came and captured the city of Tyre. But there was an island just off Tyre and so the Tyrians who were seafarers uh, just went onto this island and Nebuchadnezzar couldn't get at them. They worked very hard to take the city of Tyre 
uh, as it says, it's got an graphic description, isn't it? Every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled. There's hard work involved. Yet he had no wages for his army. Well, God says, verse 19, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labour, wherewith, uh, wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord God. They didn't know, they went for their own purpose. But God himself had a purpose in the invasion, uh, in the taking of Tyre. And so God gave Nebuchadnezzar wages to, uh, for his work against Tyre. And that's the second reason of the three that we're going to look at. Well, let's go back to uh, verse 6 now. All the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of thee by the hand, that is, break and rend all their shoulder. And when they leaned upon thee, thou breakest and madest all their loins to be at a stand. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon thee, and cut off man and beast out of thee. So that's the third reason. The first reason was the Israelites would be caught in Egypt, because they put their trust in Egypt. The second reason was that Nebuchadnezzar was given Egypt as wages for his work against Tyre. The third reason was, because Egypt had let Israel down, they were going to be punished. We see how three amongst many probably reasons uh, were fulfilled in the invasion of the land of Egypt by Nebuchadnezzar. And so if we go to verse 10, Behold therefore I am against thee and against thy rivers and will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from the Tower of Syene even unto the border of Ethiopia. Now the word for tower is the word Migdal and there's a place called Migdal on the, in the north of Egypt on the shores of the Mediterranean. Syene is the ancient name for Aswan and so uh, it's, what it's saying is that I'll make Egypt utterly de desolate from Migdal up by the Mediterranean down to Aswan unto the border of Ethiopia. It was going to be made desolate. It says, No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. And so it happened. Nebuchadnezzar did invade, and the land of Egypt did become desolate. But then, in verse 13, that thus saith the Lord God, at the end of forty years will I gather the Egyptians from the people whither they were scattered, and I will bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to re return to the land of Pathros, to the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. So they were to be a base kingdom. Uh, verse uh, 15. It shall be the basis of kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them. They shall be no more. They shall no more rule over the nations. And so it has come to pass. <coughs> the Egyptians did go back, but who could have dreamt in Ezekiel's day that Egypt, one of the greatest nations of the world at that time, would never rule over other nations. And it hasn't. It's, they, they, they tried. They tried to set up a United Arab Republic. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember uh, the, the idea. Uh, but it, it fell apart almost as soon as it had started. Uh, verse uh, 16 says, It shall no more, be no more the confidence of the house of Israel which bringeth their iniquity to remembrance. So Egypt has been a base nation. Right, let's go on to chapter 30 then. 
and look at verse 6. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of their power shall come down. From the Migdal to Syene shall they fall in it by the sword. So another prophecy concerning uh, the downfall of Egypt. But then verse 13, Thus saith the Lord God, I will destroy the idols, I will cause their images to cease out of Naf, and there shall be no more a prince of the land of Egypt, and I will put a fear in the land of Egypt. No more a prince of the land of Egypt? Or that line of pharaohs over centuries? No more a prince of the land of Egypt? Who would have dared, apart from the inspiration of God, to prophesy that, prophesy that there will be no more a prince of the land of Egypt? And so it has come to pass. For two and a half thousand years, that prophecy has been there uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be disputed, to be nullified. Just as in chapter 29, it's been a base nation, no more a prince. Oh, some of you may uh, remember somebody called King Farouk in Egypt. Uh, there was a King Farouk, but he was an Albanian. He was a descendant of somebody called Ali in the 19th century. Uh, a line of rulers that ruled over Egypt. They were Albanians. They weren't Egyptian. No more a prince of the land of Egypt. And in recent times we've had what's known as the Arab Spring. There was a revolt against Mubarak and he was deposed. And the remarkable thing about that is that Mubarak was grooming his son to take over from him to, uh, to take his place, to set up a dynasty. And that was all pulled apart by the Arab Spring. There was perhaps the most statesmanlike, nearest to a prince, might have been uh, President Sadat, uh, Anwar Sadat, who made peace with Israel. Uh, and, uh, well, he was a man of the common people. I've got a, a biography of Shimon Peres at home, and it talks about an interview between uh, Mubarak, with, uh, between Sadat. Uh, and Shimon Peres, and he says, well, should we talk man-to-man -man or should we talk in diplomatic talk? He says, oh, let's talk man-to-man. -man. I'm a man of the common people, the same as you are. No more a prince of the land of Egypt. For two and a half thousand years, God knew in the time of the prophecy of Ezekiel. Let us then wonder at the greatness of the power of our God that he is in control there's so much more that we could say about Egypt but we've seen enough to know that God is in control and the, uh, the events that have happened in connection with Egypt uh, have shown that he is indeed con in control so this is all very interesting we're not political commentators uh, why uh, are we talking to you? We want to talk about your responsibility, our responsibility because of these things. We've seen from Isaiah chapter 19 that Egypt is going to be blessed among the nations. They're going to worship the God of Israel. And then we saw back in Genesis uh, chapter 15 that God promised to the seed of Abraham the area from the river Nile to the river Euphrates. I want to turn now to the letter to the Galatians and chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Because here we see some of the relevance of these things that have happened to Egypt for us also. You remember that God said that Abram's seed would possess the land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, 
we read, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says, Not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. There's an individual here, and that individual seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is he that is going to possess that area from the Nile to the Euphrates. And if we go on to <coughs> verse 26, we see how we can be involved. For, verse 26, ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Abraham was blessed. It was counted to him for righteousness because of his faith in God. <coughs> we need to have that same faith in God. What he's promised he will perform. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So the individual seed has many parts to it. And we can be part of the seed of Abraham. Part of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are all one in in Christ Jesus by being baptised into the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are baptised into the Lord Jesus Christ, it goes on to say, verse 29, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The great God that has had control over the land of Egypt is going to fulfil his promises for Egypt and for all those that put their trust in him. Let us take hold of the call of the gospel. Obey that call by being baptised into the Lord Jesus Christ so that we too can be heirs according to the promise in that first prophecy that was made concerning Egypt.